We're happy to have you in. We're going to um, get started because Hannah always has a wonderful presentation. And so we want to make sure that we allot her her um, time. Most of you know Hannah, um, Ms. Hannah Rogers. She's from, um, is it Flip Recess at Ohio yeah. State, Hannah? Okay. Um, and so we are glad to have her today with us. Um, please make sure you put your information in the chat. That helps us as well as Hannah know who her audience is here today. And we look forward to um, you asking questions toward the end. Uh, Hannah may ask during her time um, and I want you to, to respond. So please feel free to do that. But without further ado, welcome again, uh, Ms. Hannah. And we are so glad to have you back with us today. Me too. Um... Thank you guys. I'm really excited to be here today. And if you came to my last presentation that focused on AAC um, and focused on students who are non-speaking, today we're going to be focusing on behavior basics. And really, this applies to anybody. Um, so I want to just start out and say, A, thank you for being here. But B, thank you for the work that you do every day. I want to acknowledge that Working with kids is a hard job and your job is valued and you guys as paraprofessionals especially spend as much time with students as teachers do. Um, you have the opportunity to make an impact on students' lives every single day and I hope today that we can share some ways to make that impact a positive one. Um, as you guys probably know by now, I am really, really passionate about students with multiple disabilities, um, students who are autistic, non-speaking, and really just supporting students to succeed in school by providing positive behavior supports. I believe that all students deserve access to high quality education, and I think the way that we can do that is by giving quality training to paraprofessionals and teachers so that we all have the tools that we need to be successful. I also have included my email address on here and I'll share it at the end as well. But if you ever have any questions about things that I present or if you need specific resources for your classroom and things, I'm happy to share those. Okay, so today we're really gonna go over four topics. We're gonna talk about antecedent strategies, the four functions of behavior, consequences, and rebuilding after challenging behavior. So. We have to also keep in mind that inclusive, real inclusive education is dynamic and it's ever changing. And it's an approach that requires reflection on how we've been doing and our own behavior. And it also requires a dedication to adapt based on new information. I want everybody to go into today having an open mind and knowing that we must initiate and welcome change if we really wanna best serve all students. It's important to remember too that as we talk today, you might think of things that you've done previously. I know myself, I've done things previously that weren't in the right way or maybe things that I could have done better and that's okay. Um, just because we've done something in the past doesn't mean we can't change it going forward. And we know that when we know better, do better. So please just be open-minded today. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes, and I share this at almost all of my presentations, especially those related to behavior, because I think it's really important right off the bat to establish a mindset, because mindset provides context for all the information to come. The mindset that we have creates a huge impact on the way that we do our job. It's really important to have discussions with your team about this because if you're working on a team with an IS and multiple paras, when people have different mindsets that they bring into the classroom, that can kind of create like conflict sometimes. And it's hard if everybody isn't on the same page. So this quote is by Dr. Jessica Stevens. And she says, there's no such thing as a bad kid, just an angry, hurt, tired, scared, confused, impulsive ones expressing their feelings the only way they know how. We owe it to every single one of them to remember that. So everything going forward is based on the context that there is no such thing as a bad kid. I view behavior in education in the sense that no child comes to school and wants to be bad, right? We have to get curious. What need isn't getting met? What can't they communicate to me? What are they going through? What do I need to change about my own behavior? When we get stuck in this bad kid mindset, <laughs> The only person that it hurts is ourselves because we're waiting on that kid to change and we're blaming the kid and we can only control what we can control. Um, we also need to remember that they're not giving you a hard time. They're having a hard time and it's our role to try to be that safe adult for them. 
so I know that sometimes we can fall into that like bad kid mindset like when a student is just having a really bad day and you're like they're just not doing this because they don't want to do it and they're just being rude and they're just doing it to spite me and that kind of stuff and when we start to have those thoughts it's important that I, I suggest this to everybody take a minute step away regroup reframe your thoughts if you need somebody to tap you out so that you can just take a lap and go back and give that kid the energy that they need and deserve that's going to be something that's really helpful in that time when we get caught in this mindset right we can also try to think about how we can change our own behavior or our own approach and then we also should think about what skill can we teach them so that we can kind of replace that bad behavior So like I said, with, with behavior mindset, to me, a lot of it is about accountability. Um, I believe that every child is capable of learning and it's our job as adults to hold ourselves accountable for our own behavior and our own actions. So if a student is displaying negative behavior, it's our behavior that must change. And this goes the same when it's related to academics or instruction. If a student's struggling to learn, it's our teaching strategies or our approach that needs to change. And we also need to keep the lens that all student mistakes and challenging behaviors are teachable moments. They're demonstrating to me a skill that they don't have. And that's my job to get creative and figure out how to teach that. Uh, I've also included this meme in a couple of my presentations. And I love this meme, um, perhaps his behavior has not changed because your behavior has not changed, but that's none of my business. And if we just keep waiting on that kid to change and our actions remain the same, nothing's gonna happen. You know, they say like over and over, I used to have this coach who would tell me all the time, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. If we come to school and act the exact same way as adults, and this kid is uh, quote misbehaving every single day, then of course we didn't change anything, right? We have to identify the fact that what we're doing isn't working and we need to be open to change. It's better to try something new even if you fail because clearly what we were doing originally wasn't giving that child the support they needed. Um, the, we can change and control lots of things. We can change and control our language, our instruction, the prompts that we're giving, our response, our actions, our behavior. We have the power to change all of these things in hopes that the student will in turn change their behavior. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna talk about um, is antecedent strategies. So now that we have the mindset established and kind of viewpoints established, now we're gonna go ahead and talk about these. And really antecedent strategies are anything that we can do to decrease the chance that challenging behavior happens and increase the chance of positive behavior. So antecedent, as you guys know, is something that occurs before the behavior. So what can we do on the front end to prevent that behavior from happening in the first place? So throughout the presentation today, I've decided to give some adult examples because I think that really helps like connect the dots and stuff. So an adult example of antecedent strategy one that sometimes I use at home, <laughs> is limiting access. So not buying sweets for my house. And the behavior that I'm trying to decrease is binge eating a whole thing of cake or something like that, right? Or a whole pack of hoes. And so I'm limiting access to that by not even having it in my house so that hopefully I don't engage in that behavior. Um, another example is like access to motivators. So say that I was doing like a fitness goal and if I meet a certain goal, um, then I'm gonna pick an outfit out to buy once I meet my goal or maybe get my nails done when I meet my goal. Um, we can also use an antecedent strategy by setting reminders in your phone. I'm the queen of setting reminders in my phone and setting alarms. And I'm trying to increase the chance of positive behavior, which is me remembering to do something and decrease the chance of challenging behavior, which is me forgetting about a commitment that I already had. Um, another example is visual prompts, like sometimes putting sticky notes. I know for me, like if I'm leaving work and I know that I need to stop at my mailbox and pick something up, I'll put a sticky note on my steering wheel that's like, pick up your mail, <laughs> because sometimes I'll forget. So these are all things that I'm doing on the front end to increase the chance of positive behavior, decrease the chance of 
challenging behavior. So we'll talk about some examples of antecedent strategies, but overall, antecedent strategies require us to be curious. So antecedent strategies happen before the behavior, but we already know what our kids' challenging behaviors are, right? Like we've been with them all year and we know their challenging behaviors. And so we need to think what we can do on the front end to try to prevent that. So there are three things that I really look for. I try to find their stressors. So stressors can be things like environments, locations, people, noises, like what is triggering them essentially. And I think we all need to take a minute too to remember like we have no idea what our kids' home lives are like specifically when we're working with students with disabilities and specifically, specifically <laughs> students who are non-speaking. We have no idea. And sometimes these things are going to be hard to identify. They're stressors, right? Because they're not always visible. But that's why we're trying to look for patterns. So an example of a stressor could be um, like noises and stuff. If you have a student who every time at lunch, they throw their food and run, maybe the lunchroom is too loud for them. Um, if you have certain locations that might be stressful to that person and things like that. So we're just trying to be curious. Um, unmet needs. When students' basic needs are met, they cannot access the learning. So unmet needs are things like sleep, water, food, but also things like love, belonging, understanding, and connection. It's important that every single day we try to connect with them, show interest in the things that they care about, try to build them up. And as far as sleep, water, food, try to have access to these things, like um, making sure that students have their water bottles with them and are carrying it with them. If a student is falling asleep in class, clearly they needed sleep, right? Um, but we're trying to find what those unmet needs are and trying every day to meet them. Because a lot of times behavior is happening because a need was not met. We also wanna to try to identify their skill deficits. So a student is usually behaving in a certain way because of three things, because they're triggered, because their needs aren't met, or because they don't have the skills to do so. So when we're looking at skill deficits, it might be that they're unable to like provide the correct answer. Like they literally don't understand the academic um, strategy needed, or they might not be able to communicate what they want. Um, again, we see this a lot for kids who are non-speaking. They're using their behavior to communicate with us instead of using a more appropriate form of communication. Um, another skill deficit um, that goes with like uh, being unable to perform academically a lot of times we'll see this and then the kid will engage in a behavior to avoid the academics altogether. But if we give them the power to be able to succeed at these things and teach them those skills, they're not going to need to act out in that certain way. Okay, so a lot of antecedent strategies, like I just talked about, we're trying to be curious, like what, are, what is this kid's specific behavior that their specific challenging behavior that they're demonstrating at school? And how can we identify that and teach them the skills and meet their needs and uh, try to eliminate their stressors? But that can take some time, right? Uh, to figure out a pattern or to figure out what's truly going on. I'm listing four strategies that you can use with anybody. So whether they're demonstrating challenging behavior or not, or no matter what their challenging behavior is, these are four things that we can do that are evidence-based to show that we can increase positive behavior. We can offer choices, use positive specific praise, set clear expectations, give explicit instructions, and provide non-contingent reinforcement. Okay, so offer choices. Again, if you've been to some of my trainings in the fall, we talked about this one because this is huge for students that might be considered oppositional, right? So offering choices means turning the power to the student and making them feel like they have the power to make decisions about their day. We're increasing their autonomy so that hopefully we can decrease their challenging behavior. So autonomy is all about giving the student the choice to choose how they complete something. The goal remains the same. This is not about changing the goal. If the goal is for them to complete a math activity, that is still the goal. But we're trying to make adjustments 
to figure out how we can get to that goal and make them feel like they're buying into it, right? So as adults, like people don't really tell us to do what to do very much. Um, and we have a lot of autonomy. We crave autonomy. A lot of us don't be, be, you know, we don't like being told what to do. We're constantly telling students what to do, especially if a student has communication needs. They're usually being told what to do, you know, most of their day with little opportunity to voice, you know, their opinion back. And that can be really frustrating when an adult is like telling you what to do all day long. Um, and I like to think about the offer choices thing for our students who just are like, no, I don't want to, no, because everybody has a student like that at one point in time whose answer to everything is no. But how can a student say no to something if it's something that they chose? So it's all about getting them to buy into it. And this prevents the power struggle because we're empowering that child to make their own choices. So the benefits of this are that it increases on-task behavior and decreases challenging behavior. This is evidence-based, research-based. It teaches students that their opinions matter. We care about what they have to say. And again, with communication needs, like validating every time that they're communicating with us and trying to honor that and showing them that their voice, their words have meaning. Um, it promotes independence and it teaches decision-making skills. So we can do this in a variety of ways. So like, if, again, I'll give the example with we're trying to complete this math task and we need to get it done. So we can let the student choose if they say, all right, we're ready to start. And the student's like, no, I'm not doing it. Okay, we're not gonna feed into the no. We're gonna say, all right, well, do you wanna do it with a pencil or the glitter marker? Um, we can ask them, how many do you wanna do? Do you wanna do five math problems or 10? We can say, which order do you wanna do? Do you wanna start at the end or at the beginning? We're just flipping the script back on them, right? And we can say, when do you wanna do it? Do you wanna do it now? Or do you wanna go walk to the water fountain and do it when we get back? We can say, where do you wanna do it? Do you wanna do it on the floor or do you wanna sit at your desk? Who do you wanna do it with? Do you wanna do it with me or do you wanna do it with your friend? And it's all about still keeping that goal in mind, but changing the route to how we get there and letting the student pick that route. Um, an example of like how to do it, like if you're trying to transition with a kid, okay, do you want to walk there or do you want to run there? Do you want to walk there? Or do you want to walk backwards? <laughs> um, how many do you want to do? You know, do you want to do 10 sight words or 20? Like just trying to flip that back on them is going to get so much more buy-in and reduce the power struggle where it's like you're the one making the choices and telling them what to do because we don't, as adults and as humans, we don't really love that. <laughs> Okay, next is positive specific praise. So powerful, takes really minimal effort. <laughs> so positive specific praise is about catching them doing the right thing. So every praise statement, positive specific praise statement needs three things. A lot of times all, all I'll hear is like, good job, Matt, or way to go, or that looks good, right? What looks good? Good job about what? And so we want to make sure that we're in there, we're including the description of the behavior that we want to see more often. So like I had a kid who would come in my classroom, run in the room, slam the door and jump on a crash pad as soon as he got in the door. And so we worked so hard on like the replacement behavior of softly shutting the door and coming right to your seat. And the second that I see them do one of those things that I ask, I'm going to say, great job shutting the door quietly. Great job coming to your seat. I'm trying to point out that specific thing that they did in hopes that they will do that in the future. And positive specific praise is one of the most um, evidence-based practices that we can use. It has so much research over the last 30 years on it. Um, the important piece to remember with this, whenever I compare it to adults, I think about like, if I, I have really long hair, if I got my hair cut to here and I went over to my friend's house and I was like, oh my gosh, do you like my hair? And they're like, oh, like, no, I don't know. I don't think you should have cut your hair. I would hold on to that. And it would take multiple people telling me, Hannah, your hair looks so good for me to forget about the thing that the first person told me um, and the negative thing. We, hold, we as humans hold on to those negative things. 
whether we like it or not. They're always kind of in our subconscious. And so for every corrective feedback statement that we give, so corrective feedback is like when a student does something incorrectly and we're trying to help them and they know that they made a mistake or they know they messed up. We need to give them five praise statements for every one corrective feedback statement in order for them to move on from that um, corrective feedback statement or that negative statement. And I love this stat that for students who have been through trauma, this number increases from 10 to one. Our language can make a huge impact on kids and language to me is the easiest thing to fix because it's something that we can identify so easily and we can do it anywhere. Okay, so I saw a question in the chat. How do you incorporate these practices when the student is nonverbal and no communication? So this is right up my alley. All my students, um, I'd say 80 to 90% of my caseload every year was students who are non-speaking. So um, in the previous slide, when I was talking about choice, and if you came to my last presentation on AAC, we talked about um, using visuals, using different communication supports to make sure that they have a voice about something. So an and if somebody has no communication, it's important to keep in mind they don't have communication yet because this kid is in school. I mean, they have the whole rest of their life to try to develop communication. But we can notice the things that they have, like if they're unable to select what they want. So um, for offer choice, if I said to them, do you wanna do it at the table or on the floor? I could have a picture of the table and a picture of the floor and they would be able to select from those two things. If the student is unable to select and they have really, really limited communication skills, we want to keep in mind, where are they having a good time? Where can we notice in their gestures, facial expression, attitude, that they're liking something and enjoying something? And you can kind of try different things and see how they react. With positive specific praise, this is all about the adult. So it's about our language and we're noticing things that that student does. I think it's also important to remember that when a student has limited communication, that's limited expressive communication. So they have most times have great receptive communication. They're listening, they hear us. And even if you don't you know, have visible proof or think that they can, they are listening. And that's what the positive specific praise is about, is about our input and our language. Thank you, that was a great question. Thanks for asking. Um, next is setting clear expectations and giving explicit instructions. Clear expectations and explicit instructions, again, are about language, and this is an easy thing to identify. So I want everybody to remember, directions are statements. They are not questions. How often do we hear people say, can you go line up? Should you be throwing those cars? Will you put your lunch away? We're not giving them a choice. This is the direction. <laughs> because anytime we ask a question, it's like, don't ask a question that you don't want an answer to. So if we are saying, do you want to, or go, I think you should go put your lunch away. Should you put your lunch away? You shouldn't be throwing those cars. Like they might just say no <laughs> or whatever, right? We don't want to ask questions that we don't want an answer to. Do not phrase directions as questions. They are statements. And I think as adults, it might be like more common um, when we're interacting with adults to do those things. Like, would you mind doing X, Y, Z? And, but with kids, it's like, this is what we're doing. So um, I want you guys to remember that. And I know after this presentation, you will catch yourself. I still catch myself. And a lot of times um, I'll start asking a question and then I, I pause for a sec and then I state it as a direction. So it's gonna take some time to getting used to. It's just about reframing. Also, we wanna tell the student exactly what we want them to do. My pet peeve is when people tell students what we don't want them to do, which is like, don't run up the stairs. Prime example, don't run in the hallway. Okay, <laughs> well, we didn't tell them to walk, right? Um, another example is like, don't throw food. Okay, all they hear is throw food. <laughs> so we need to say, keep it on your plate. We wanna give directions based on what we want to see, not what we don't want to see. When we start framing things in a way, um, or I guess about things that we don't wanna see, it draws attention to that behavior. Example, don't yell out in class. Don't make fun of your teacher, right? We're not telling them what we want them to do. And honestly, sometimes they might not know exactly what to do. So like if they're yelling out in class because they need help with something, 
then we need to teach them about asking a buddy first and modeling all this stuff and kind of going back to the basics. Even if they know this skill, it's really helpful to review that with them and role play and practice it with them and stuff. Um, and kind of the last piece of this is creating a visual routine or schedule because this is going to increase predictability and we can also use like transition warnings. So um, for students who have limited communication or maybe in some of our MD classrooms, a visual schedule might be more appropriate. For students who are, are ED students or who are in all kinds of different classrooms, they might just do well with a checklist. Like if we're doing an activity in class or an activity in science, for example, there might be a warm up activity and then there might be a reading activity and then an experiment. Even just writing that on a dry erase board or a post-it note and crossing things off as they go is really helpful. And then if you know that the student is struggling and they feel like they need to like get out of the room or they're trying to escape, um, whatever it is, you can add that to their schedule too. So for example, if this were a science class, all right, we got the warm up, and then we're going to take a lap around the hallway and you can add that to their schedule. And then we're going to do the reading and then we're going to take a lap and then we're going to come back and do the experiment. And that way they know that it's already built in and there's a lot of predictability happening. We're going to give them transition warnings. They have the visual right in front of them. So using a visual or a schedule or a checklist is really, really helpful. Same with like timers. Um, okay, and the last antecedent strategy we're gonna talk about is non-contingent reinforcement. So non-contingent just means it's not dependent on or associated with or conditioned by something else. And in this case, it's reinforcement that's given without needing to see a certain behavior. This is reinforcement or giving just cause. And that's something that I feel like there's just a lot of debate around sometimes. Like there's this one side of it where it's like, well, a student shouldn't be rewarded for doing what they're supposed to do. And then there's another side of it that's like, well, student better earn it, right? <laughs> this is all about just giving them the access in hopes that we will like have that problem behavior become unnecessary. So I'll give an, give an example of this. I'll give two. So I had a student who loved to run outside. I mean, he just loved being outside. I had a door in my classroom that connected to outside, which was convenient sometimes, but inconvenient for other kids. So every day he would run out the door in my classroom. And I knew that he loved being outside. He loved to run around outside. So I built it into a schedule. Every morning when he got to school, as long as the weather was okay, if not, we would do it inside. But if the weather was okay, him and one of my paras, they would do three laps around the building and they would do this as soon as he got there at lunchtime and right before he went home. And that was built into his schedule. He did not run out the door after that because that's all he was trying to do. He just wanted to get outside. Uh, a lot of times we might have situations where kids are obsessed with iPads, right? And it's all about do this and then the iPad. Well, sometimes let's just give them access to it and build it into their schedule, right? Like if they know every day at 1050 to 11, they're going to have access to that, then they don't need to act out to try to get access to it, right? Um, same with attention. A lot of times we have students who are yelling out in class or um, doing things in class to try to get attention from their peers. What if we set up a time, you know, five minutes before the class started where them and some peers can just talk and chat and get all that out. Or maybe they can go for a walk and try to connect, right? Um, once we find what function their behavior is serving, so why they're doing the behavior, we'll know better how to implement these uh, reinforcement strategies. So we're gonna talk about the functions next. Um, really, there are four functions of behavior and Everything we as humans do, adults, kids, anybody, serves one of these functions. All behavior is communicating something. So when we think about functions of behavior, the biggest thing is curiosity. And I talk about this um, a lot as well because I want, kids aren't doing things just cause. They're not doing things out of the blue. This didn't just happen out of nowhere. Um, and even if it feels like that to us, because it might be something that we can't see, might be something happening in their mind, it might be a pattern we haven't identified yet. Things don't just happen. Um, so we want to be curious, like, what is their behavior trying to communicate? Um, what needs are they trying to get met? What happened before, during, and after the behavior? 
what person, place, language might be triggering to them, um, what experiences or trauma have happened previously. We're not going to know this one right off the bat, uh, especially for kids who are non-speaking. We may not know this for a really long time. Um, and what skills or communication do I need to teach them? Um, and then I saw that somebody put in here about, I find it hard to offer choices when I have students for only 30 minutes. So offering choices can be something that's built in to your directions. So for example, if I was leading a lesson and say I was like leading a reading lesson and I'm giving the directions, I'm saying, I want everybody to go get their book and I want you to find a seat. When you find a seat, you can either sit at the table or you can sit on the floor within, you know, I had a lot of floor visuals. So I'd say within the red square. When you sit down, um, you can either get a red marker or a crayon. Things like that that are already built in so that kids know that they have the option for choice. They can also <clears throat> build that into lessons, um, you know, if it's just one kid, but also it benefits everybody. Offering choices is something that's evidence-based that benefits everybody in the room, not just kids with disabilities, not just kids struggling. Okay, so the four functions of behavior. All behavior serves a function, all behavior is communication. Everything falls into four categories. When we talk about this, I'm giving some adult examples because I think that helps um, us connect to things, but four things, sensory, connection seeking, this is also called attention seeking by some, tangible, and escape. Okay, so let's talk about sensory first. This to me is like the hardest to figure out sometimes. So Sensory, when the function is, when the function is sensory, it means that it feels good to engage in that behavior. So it's automatically reinforced. This means that the kid or adult, it can happen even when we're alone. It provides access to like sensory stimulation and it just feels good. So this can happen anytime in the presence or absence of another person. Um, it can happen a lot, especially if you're really excited about something or really anxious about something. So an adult example of a behavior that was serving a sensory function is eating a pint of ice cream alone on a Saturday night. That just feels good sometimes, you know? <laughs> um, twirling your hair, cracking your knuckles, popping pimples, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Something that just like feels good. I know I like twirl my hair a lot or like pick at my nails. And that's a sensory um, behavior. For a child, this could be something like putting everything in their mouth, um, stimming, which is okay. And how to respond. So when we see this in kitten, not every behavior needs a response, right? I'm giving examples here to just identify what the behavior or what function the behavior is serving. But not like, for example, stimming, like stimming's okay. You know, if a kid is like scripting to themselves, that doesn't bother me. That's not hurting anybody. Um, so it's okay to not have an action plan, right? This is just for when the behavior might be unsafe or a challenging behavior that we do need to improve. So for an example, child putting everything in their mouth, that's not safe. So how to respond, we want to teach a functional replacement behavior that provides a compatible sensory input. So something that serves the exact same function. So for sensory, they're putting stuff in their mouth because they want stuff in their mouth because that feels good. We can give them access to a chewy or some gum or something like that because that's going to serve the same function. And the replacement behavior needs to match the function. Those two things need to match. A child putting everything in their mouth and then us like putting them in timeout with like no things around them, th that doesn't connect the dots. That's not serving that function, right? The next is escape. So escape behavior is super common for both kids and adults. Um, why? <laughs> um, escape usually is to get out or avoid an undesired situation, task, or a person. And really, it's like to provide relief, like, get me out of here. I don't want to do this. Um, so this happens. Like, when does this happen? It's usually when something is too hard or too easy or something is overstimulating or understimulating. So an adult example is like canceling plans that 
I didn't want to do in the first place. So like somebody asked me to get coffee, but I just don't want to go. I might just be like, hey, I'm not feeling well. I'm sick, right? I'm trying to escape. I don't want to go do that. Um, another example is like hanging up on somebody and then being like texting them and being like, oh, I don't have any service or my call dropped, my phone died. Like I'm just trying to get out of that situation. So that's escape behavior. Um, and that's how it plays out for adults. An example for a child is intentionally getting sent to the principal's office to avoid class. So if a kid is in writing class and they hate to write and every day they yell out, and make fun of the teacher knowing that they'll get sent to the principal's office so that they don't need to do the writing. That's an example of how that plays out. Um, another example is like avoiding social situations due to anxiety, um, like running away or dropping to the floor. <laughs> um, that happens a lot. Um, or trying to run away from the classroom or which is called elopement. Um, the ways that we can combat this when it does become something that's challenging is by teaching that student to request a break. Um, so instead of running out of the classroom because they don't wanna do something, we can just build the break into their schedule or when they're feeling overwhelmed or just wanna get out of a situation, we can give them like a break card to keep in their pocket that says like, I need a break or something like that if they're non-speaking or have communication needs. And then when they're feeling like they need to escape a situation, they can hand it to you and you say, okay, let's go take a break. Because that's such a more appropriate way to communicate than them dropping to the floor and screaming their head off and waiting for you to react. Um, another way that we can do this is dividing a task into smaller parts. So in the example with somebody who would just make fun of the teacher and yell out so that they could get sent to the principal's office. Okay, first task of the day for writing is we're going to write one sentence. That's better than them getting sent to the principal's office and missing out on the activity altogether. We just are breaking it into smaller tasks, smaller goals. Um, another example for escape is give choices, which we talked about in the previous slides about autonomy and giving the power back to the student. Why would a student want to escape something when they're the ones who want to do it that way? Um, another example is incorporating interests. I had kids who... Um, love to do like Paw Patrol and <laughs> Roblox, like all that kind of stuff. Um, or you might have older kids who like love the Cleveland Browns or the Bengals or something. Just try to incorporate that and motivate them to want to do a task. I love somebody put in here, elementary kids breaking their pencil lead to avoid, lead to avoid doing work. Okay, my suggestion for that would be okay, can they do it with a marker or a crayon or, well, I guess crayon could break, but, or a pen. Can they just try to use something else because they still need to do that work. And them breaking a pencil means that they can still complete it, just maybe not with a pencil because they're not responsible enough. Um, okay, attention and connection, connection seeking. So attention and connection seeking is all about trying to get a reaction or an interaction with another person. Um, kids do this, well, all people do this, um, so that we can get a positive, it can be, we want a reaction from others. And this reaction can be positive or negative. Both can be reinforcing to people. Um, but they do this because they want a reaction. And they also might be doing this because they want to feel connected. Like they wanna know that you see them, hear them, feel understood. They want your attention. They want you to care. So an, ex an example for an adult is like when somebody posts a selfie on Instagram or Facebook and it's like, it's such a bad day. And they're like waiting for people to comment like, oh, you're the best. Like, it's okay. Do you want to go get coffee? And that kind of stuff. Another example is like texting an ex like, oh, I just want, so I want some attention and I want somebody to like make me feel understood and like I matter, right? Because I'm lonely. So those are examples of how that would play out in adult, for adults. A child exam example would be like a child screaming and yelling in class because they know that you're going to walk yourself over there and say, stop screaming and yelling. Now, the problem with especially behavior like that where they're doing something and then we're giving them attention, it's further reinforcing that behavior because they want you to connect with them. They want you to come over there. So they're doing something that's gonna lead you to do that. Um, and in that situation, I said, stop yelling, quit doing that. 
which we already talked about, we don't want to say, no, stop, don't. We're going to say, we're going to have a quiet voice, right? We're not drawing attention to that negative behavior. Um, an example is like another example that sadly I've had happen to me. <laughs> um, pull your pants down the middle of the hallway. You know somebody's going to react immediately, right? Um, yelling out in class and making fun of the teacher in front of everybody. Everybody can hear you. You're getting everybody's attention. To me, attention is a really, really tough one because a lot of times this will happen in a huge group and it can be reinforced by the peers around them. And that's something that's really difficult. Um, but how can we respond to this? So we can provide attention in positive ways before challenging behavior happens. So like I said, that's an antecedent strategy, something we're doing on the front end in hopes that we'll see the right thing going forward. Um, and then that's also non-contingent reinforcement. We're giving them all our attention or peers are giving them all their attention on the front end in hopes that they don't need to engage in that problem behavior because they're getting what they wanted anyway. Um, we can also teach the student to request and receive positive attention through engaging in desired behavior, desirable behaviors. So like if they feel like they need some connection, maybe requesting um, to go for a walk or to like schedule a time to just talk with you or talk with a friend. Um, the really important thing with attention and connection seeking, it used to kind of be that the general practice was ignore the behavior, ignore them. So, because if we give them attention, that's exactly what they wanted, right? So a lot of times they would just say ignore the behavior. Now, that can be kind of problematic because we want to ignore the behavior. Like we want to ignore the screaming and yelling or them pulling their pants down or whatever it is. But we don't want to ignore the person because when we start to ignore the person, we're kind of like giving up, right? We're not telling them how to correct it and how to do better. So we can ignore the behavior and not acknowledge it. So for example, if the kid pulled their pants down in the middle of the hallway, I'm not going to say, why'd you pull your pants down? We can't do that at school and all those things. Maybe I can talk about that later, <laughs> but in the moment, just, all right, at school, everybody keeps their hands up, put yours up, right? Um, and I'm not dwelling on that negative behavior, essentially. And then another thing that we can do that's helpful is just asking them what they need. Like a lot of times, if they are verbal, they will tell us. Um, so those are the th three ways so far, three functions so far. And the last one is tangible. Oh, so access to a tangible item. So access to something. So if a student is engaged, I see if a behavior is ignored, then the student starts to self-harm. If safety is an issue, we will immediately intervene. Um, I've also had students who engage in self-injurious behavior and that's something totally different. Um, and hopefully in those situations, a uh, behavior specialist can be involved because self-injurious behavior is something that's really serious and really hard. Um, if the behavior is ignored and they start to engage in self-harm, we always are going to need to intervene. And that's what makes it really hard sometimes and why we might need additional supports in place because if they are trying um, to harm themselves, then we'll always have to intervene, which can sadly be reinforcing things. And that's really hard to deal with. Um, so access to tangible. Um, this is all about getting access to a highly preferred item or a highly preferred activity. So they want something, right? Um, this happens when they are really wanting a specific item or a specific activity. So like for an adult, like if I'm sitting here on a Friday night and I really want a pizza, I'm going to door dash that pizza. I really want something. That sounds really good to me. Um, an example of a child would be like throwing a fit in the hallway because they know that the teacher is going to give them an iPad to calm them down and lure them back into the classroom. They want that iPad and they know that every time that they have a meltdown that that's going to get pulled out. <laughs> um, another example is like if a student steals another student's toy, like a kid was playing with Buzz Lightyear and they really wanted to play with Buzz Lightyear too and they just took it right out of their hand. Now, how can we respond to that? So we're not going to say, don't take their toy. That's theirs. You can't have it. That's not yours. We're going to teach them to request it or teach them how to wait or just exhibit some sort of behavior before granting access to that item. So um, an example for um, the Buzz Lightyear toy, if they stole it from somebody, my exact response would be, hey, um, you know, Sarah was playing with that toy first. 
So if you want to play with that toy, we can ask her, let's practice. I would give the toy to Sarah and I would show them, okay, if you want to play with it, you need to tap her on the shoulder and say, can I play with it? All right, let's do it. And then I would have the kid practice it right then and there. Tangible is a really easy one to teach the skill. Of how can they get what they want appropriately and at a certain time, right? And sometimes it's about waiting. How do we wait? You know, Sarah said, okay, you can have it, but not right now. Then what do we do in the meantime? We talk about um, activities that we can do while we're waiting and we try to figure that out. But it's the issue isn't that they want something and we can't give it to them. It's they want something and they need to figure out how to get that appropriately or wait for it. Okay, consequences. So consequences are whatever happens after the behavior. And we have to remember sometimes like we do these antecedent strategies. We hope that that behavior doesn't happen. Sometimes it's gonna happen. Um, if a student does become escalated, so if they're crying, yelling, screaming, um, and you can tell that we know when a kid's getting worked up, right? So when a student is escalated though, the focus is not on solving the problem and it's not on delivering the consequence. Our focus is, is on de-escalating them. So I have this visual here and it's the brain essentially. So these are the four um, like layers of our brain and we process from the bottom up. So when we are overwhelmed like that, all we're trying to do is like regulate our temperature and our heart rate and all that kind of stuff. We literally cannot access the thinking part of our brain. And that's why the focus isn't on solving the problem or the consequence because kids don't even have the ability to do that at that time. They're just trying to calm themselves down. So we have to remember that when a student's escalated, our goal isn't to talk about the consequences, it's to deescalate them. Um, and I have some examples here on how to support an escalated student. And I've talked about this in one of my previous ones. So I'm just going to touch on a couple things. Um, so first, just what not to do. Like, we don't want to use that language of calm down, stop doing that. Why are you doing that? Drawing attention to that negative behavior, right? We don't want to use like blame or judgmental language. Like you're being bad. You're being disrespectful. Compare them to other students who are doing better. We don't want to raise our voice, roll our eyes, um, talk about the student as if others aren't there and use empty threats. Empty threats that I hear a lot is like, if you don't stop, you're never going out to recess or you're never touching that iPad the rest of the day and that kind of stuff. Um, so instead, we want to show compassion, empathy. This kid is struggling. Like they are in a full-blown meltdown right now, right? The focus is to calm them down because once they're calmed down, then we can talk about consequences. Then we can talk about accountability. We can't talk about that right now. Um, we want to address the person before the problem. So like, I see you're feeling upset. That must have been really hard for you. We want to offer our help and support. Like, how can I help you? What do you need? Sometimes we just shouldn't say anything. Supportive silence can go a really long way. Um, respect our personal space. When I'm upset and stuff and, you know, I don't want anybody near me. I don't want anybody trying to talk to me. Like, I need my space. Um, and also, like, giving the student an expected choice that they can make, like, all right, well, when you're done, we're going to clean up this classroom or something once you see that they're a bit calmer. Um, and also, like, practice a coping skill together. Like, if they're really escalated, you gave them space, you tried, you know, restorative language, all these things. Sometimes you can just sit there and model a coping skill, which could be, like, pacing back and forth, breathing, um, that kind of stuff. So those are just some easy ways that we can support an escalated student before we even think about the consequences. Um, I shared this mantra in the fall when I did a uh, presentation. Working with escalated students is really, really tough. Like, I mean, it tests every piece of you, you know? And me and my team would say, I can help most when I am calm. When they get louder, I get calmer. It is so easy when a kid is escalated to just match that energy, right? But we need to model the energy that we want to see from them. So if we want them to be calm, we need to be calm. And kids can feel that energy, right? So um, this is something that you can help, I feel like, <laughs> try to tell yourself in your mind because it's easy to get caught up in that chaos. And needless to say, like supporting an escalated child is just really tough. So these are things that we've done that help us stay a little bit sane. Um, okay, so now for consequences though. So consequences need to be directly related to the behavior. So they need to be related 
respectful, reasonable, and helpful. Um, related to be re, related to the behavior would be like if the student um, and I have some examples on the next slide. So like if a student made a mess or destroyed like this area, their consequence is to clean it up and fix it. What does them being in a timeout or us taking away recess from them do? Maybe they need to stay in from recess until they clean it and fix it. But those other things, those aren't tied to what they did. It needs to be respectful so it doesn't blame, shame, or pain the student. They shouldn't be sitting in front of the room where everybody can see them and, you know, being like embarrassed or something. It must be reasonable. It must be developmentally appropriate. Um, and it must be helpful. So the whole goal of a consequence isn't to punish the kid. It's to help the behavior in the future and give them a tool to use in the future. Um, if a consequence is not related to the behavior, it will never work in the long term because they will never demonstrate that behavior in the future um, because we didn't show them how. Consequences are a teaching moment and an opportunity to improve in the future. Another example is like, um, if you keep waving your scissors, all right, no scissors. Just like the pencil example, you break your pencil, no pencil. Here's a marker, can't break that. So that consequence is tied together. I'm not, you broke your pencil, so you don't get to do this activity and you can sit in the back and watch everybody else, right? Here's your consequence, you don't get to use it. Um, another example is like touching other kids during group, like not honoring people's personal space. Okay, move their chair back three feet. They can participate still. So um, especially like timeouts are just like, oh, it's just one of those things for me. And especially if the behavior is escape, which escape is like, I don't want to do this, get me out of here. A timeout is exactly what they want. <laughs> so a timeout, we really got to think through that because it's never really related to the behavior. So our consequences need to be related. That's the biggest thing. Of course, they need to be respectful, reasonable, helpful, but related. If you take anything away from this, they need to be related. Illogical or unrelated punishment is something that's imposed by an adult, unrelated to the offense, punitive, and is really just about asserting power. So like, this is like taking away recess for destroying the room in the morning. Like, how are those things connected? A timeout in the hallway for throwing things, taking a toy from a student at recess. So now you got to come inside and sit in the classroom, no more recess. Instead, why don't I teach them how to get that toy? All right. But like banning students from going to class parties or assemblies because they refuse to listen and do their work. Like those things just are not connected. Last thing I'm going to talk about today is just rebuilding. So like the kid engaged in a certain behavior, they were escalated. We talked about the consequence, but like, what do we do after that? Because that when students have that negative behavior and stuff, like that can kind of damage your relationship with them sometimes. Um, if you're the one who is with them the most and you're the one who's a lot of times like correcting them and stuff. So first things first, reflect on your own behavior and apologize if necessary, okay? There is no shame in apologizing. Rather, there is power. And we need to normalize apologizing to children when we as adults mess up and if we do mess up. So I love this quote. Um, there's this account on Instagram. It's called The Calm Classroom, but I suggest it to anybody. She's wonderful. But she said, you are not weak or soft because you're empathetic, speak softly, or refrain from using typical punitive practices. It takes strength to prioritize peace, set emotion aside, and put student needs first during the challenging moments. So reflect. If you need to apologize for something, great, because you might model how they can apologize to you or apologize to somebody else for something that they did. What happens when you apologize to children? You demonstrate it's okay to make mistakes. You remind them that they deserve respect. You teach them how to apologize effectively. You repair and strengthen your relationship and reestablish safety and trust with them. Only positive things can come from you apologizing to a student if that's something you need to do. And then there's two types of language that you use here, judgmental language and restorative. We talked about this a bit, but judgmental is like, why'd you do that? How could you do that? Now you need to think about what you've done. And it's all about the person is the problem. Like what's wrong with you? It focuses on control. It focuses on punishments, right? That's judgmental. We want to focus on restorative language. What happened? What were you feeling? Who have you hurt with the choice you made? What do you think you can do to make it better next time? What, what do you think you can do to make it right? 
It focuses on the problem. How can me and you fight this problem together? It focuses on accountability and holding kids account accountable for their actions, and making sure that they're being honest. And it focuses on moving forward and teaching the skill. There's no sense on dwelling on what happened before, right? We wanna use restorative language to improve it in the future. Okay, and then the last thing we're gonna talk about is just the kids are finally de-escalated. We've rebuilt the relationship, apologize if necessary. Like now what? Now what do we do? We wanna co-regulate. So do a regulation strategy together. I know after I am working so hard to de-escalate this kid, I'm beat, right? <laughs> like I need a minute too. And so we can practice the skill together, like going for a walk, just filling up our water, drawing, doing a breathing exercise, anything that's rhythmic. So like music, walking, drawing, drinking. Um, but the key point is like, we can provide the options and model, but like we need the student to make the choice too. So when we start saying, sit here and breathe with me, like if they don't want to, we're not gonna force them, you know? Um, we wanna just model it so they can have the opportunity to do that. We wanna talk calmly and privately about what happened. We're not talking about this in front of other kids. We're sticking to the facts. We're using restorative language and we're listening to their input. We're going to discuss what's going to happen next. So that was the logical consequence that we were talking about. And we're going to agree to the next steps. We want that student to buy into the logical consequence and have a plan for next time. 